Now entering the squared circle pit, someone I wanted to talk to for a very long time, a, a huge influence on me, the heavy metal mensch of pro wrestling, Paul Heyman. Paul, I love how you sneak in these Yiddish words into your promos. As a New York Jew myself, it always brings me joy. Well, then we have filled the quota, I guess. <laughs> I got plenty more. You know, I'm schwitzing. There's a lot. <laughs> oh, very nice. I'm a huge influence on you personally, professionally, or uh, just for two people with a Yiddish kapala. I would say professionally, ECW ha had a big influence on me. Like this podcast is called Squared Circle Pit. It explores the intersection of heavy metal and pro wrestling. And I feel like ECW, I was a wrestling fan as a kid. And when I found ECW, I got Philadelphia channels in my parents' room, channel 48. And I watched it and I was blown away. And that's how I got into hard rock and heavy metal. And now I'm a full-time publisher of a metal website. So... So if it wasn't for ECW, I mean, I'm sure I, I would have found rock or metal some other way, but it was definitely through ECW. Did we introduce you to Motorhead? No, uh, you introduced me to Rob Zombie, Nine Inch Nails, definitely. Uh, oh, yeah, all, well. All, I, I mean, even, even some hip hop with like the natural born kill us stuff and all that and just every, everything there. I mean, you do realize that uh, the Motorhead version of Enter Sandman, which was on the very first ECW al album. I mean, my God, we were talking about. Oh, that's right. How many years ago is this? Yeah, yeah the, 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 the Le Lemmy's cover, Motorhead's cover of Enter Sandman, which was the featured song on the first ECW album release from BMG Music, was Emmy nominated. I remember that. I remember. It's just fascinating to, 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 to think about because, you know, again, I mean, though it was released by BMG, Obviously, we didn't have the platform to publicize like like what was then WWF, now WWE albums. We 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 got the Emmy, not, not the Emmy Grammy. Well, did I say Emmy? I mean, Grammy. I think you might have said. Uh, the, 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 the 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 Grammy nominated cover of Enter Sandman by Motorhead. I do remember that. By then, I, that that was already. I was in college, and I was actually I was spinning that uh, on my college radio show. Which is so funny. Uh, well, I want to ask, now that we're deep into it with, with ECW, one thing that always blew my mind was, uh, you know, once once I got older, is learning about copyright and licensing fees. And ECW was a small company. And here you are licensing the biggest rock bands in the world, like Guns N' Roses and Metallica. Like, and, you know, and Metallica are known to be very litigious. <laughs> How did you get by the copyright law? Like what kind of licensing deal? Like what was the deal basically <laughs> to get those songs played? We, we actually had three, three different types of deals in ECW regarding music. Mm -hmm. One, which is the easy one to talk about. They're all easy to talk about. The easiest one to talk about was there were several labels Tommy Boy Music was 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 a was a sponsor of ours from the from the very early days. There was another label in New York. I, I I wish I could remember the name of it, and I should, and I have no excuse as to why I don't remember the name of it. Uh, but but there was another label in New York that had some real avant garde music with some great up and coming artists, and uh, and and they would always provide us uh, Gerald Cosloy. I believe was the president of, of the label and uh, and they would provide us with music. And we also went, went out of our way, like uh, the very early days of ECW, we featured slam by Onyx. And we had, we had written rights to that music. We had uh, Jeru, the, the, uh, the damage. Uh, we had three, six, Ma we were the first television uh, television show to ever feature three, six mafia. And we had cut a deal with the band and the label uh, so we, we had we had deals like that. You know, we went out of our way to find up and coming artists that we knew we could feature. Uh, we, we did have rights to, to White Zombie. Uh, we cut a deal for that. There was no money involved. It was, it was a publicity deal and a rights exchange, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was the first type of deal that we had. The second type of deal that we had was at times with uh, playing the music video and intercutting the, the ECW action with the music video. So we, we, we would get, you know, a certain certain rights to uh, to run the music video along with the ECW footage, as long as we didn't use the music live, which we ended up doing anyway. And the third one, which was 
like what we had with Metallica or Natural Born Killers for for New Jack and 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 uh, and, and, and and a lot of other of the music. We we just gangsted it. We just stole it. We, that that's who we were. I mean, we 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 were a, a no pun intended or all pun in, all puns intended for the name of our first paper. We were a barely legal promotion. We were gangsters. We, you know, we had no money. First of all, we 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 were in the most hyper competitive environment in the history of sports entertainment slash pro wrestling against two billion dollar companies, and we had no money. All we had was balls, bullshit, and bravado. So we would say, hey, Sandman's going to come out to enter Sandman by Metallica. And he did. So when we would get these cease and desist letters from the labels or from the publishers, what are they going to sue us for? We had no money. So come and sue us. Well, what, what, what do you, you, can, you can probably stop us with a court order, but then they're going to have to pay their attorneys to go into court and file an injunction and then serve us, which... We were pretty good at avoiding servicing for a while. So, you know, what I would usually do is I would call the attorneys. And these were some very, you know, very big law firms, too. Uh, Loeb and Loeb. Uh, we, we had a famous battle with Loeb and Loeb. And, uh, and, and, I, and I sat down with them and, and they were recording as if it was a deposition. And they, and they were recording the meeting. And I just said, why don't you give us the music? Why don't you let us publicize you? Well, you know, we'll end up we'll end up putting it on a on a video game. We'll end up putting it on an album, and uh, you know, we'll 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 end up all making some money on it, and we'll run a lower third graphic, uh, you know, publicizing your music. And they're like, "No, you can't do that. You can't steal and then backdoor your way into using our music after you stole our music." And I was like, "I think you you you, should, you guys should file a lawsuit. You guys should definitely. You know, I'm here. You can serve me now." You want to run across the street to the federal courthouse? I'll wait for you, and you can serve me. And 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 then they would realize, oh, this fucking guy has no money. They have no money. I mean, we 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 we, we you know at, at our best we, we we had no money. So what are you going to sue us for? You're going to sue us to stop us. So they're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in litigation simply to stop us. It was easier just to let us do what we wanted to do. Um, once we got on the pay-per-view, there was the whole discussion of ambient music. It's like how baseball, it's like how baseball does it. Uh, when, when Major League Baseball plays licensed music at the ballpark, they, 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 they're not paying rights fees. They, they, they may pay a small fee for the right for live usage, but they're not when they're on NBC or CBS or or Fox or ABC or or, or ESPN or Yes Network. They, they're not paying these rights fees they're, because there's no direct fee. It's ambient. It's part of the background noise. So we didn't do a direct feed of our music most of the time uh, on pay per view or or when we were on a TNN. Uh, so we didn't, we weren't subject to the license fees then. We, we also had the, you know, the argument that it was ambient music, uh, same as baseball, same as football, same as all these other things. But in terms of using the music on the ECW program, most of the time we were just thieves. You just did it. <laughs> you know, you look at all these podcasts that are out now, Sammy, the bull Gravano and John a light and Michael Francis. And, and they, you know, and then, and then they talk about the gangster life. We were an outlaw promotion. We were the rebels in the industry. We were the disruptors. We, we, we were a barely legal promotion. And that, and that was, we were fight club. And that was part, not only was that part of the lore of ECW, it was the only way we were going to survive. We had no money. When I step in to be the, to, to, to run the creative in ECW in September, 1993, Todd Gordon, uh, who was the then owner of the company, was quickly running through a line of credit that was backed up by his family's um, jewelry business. And he was at the end of his rope. There wasn't any money left. And, and literally every show that we ran had to sell out at the ECW arena or there was not going to be a next show. So the first six months in ECW, every show was do or die. It was life or death. By the time 
I changed the name from Eastern Championship Wrestling to Extreme Championship Wrestling. Again, we were, you know, dollars away from, from bankruptcy. You know, we lasted seven and a half years on the balls of our ass. Um, and going back to the gravano Francis uh, A-Light analogy, here we are now 25, 30 years later, we can discuss the fact we were a gangster promotion. We were an outlaw promotion and we did outlaw things. We don't need to glamorize it and, 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 and play into the fantasy that ECW is a gang of rebels and, and outlaws and gangsters because we were. And, and it was the only way that we were going to survive in that era. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think the, the label, by the way, is Mat- Matador Records that you were trying to. No, yes. Holy shit. Yes. Yes, Matt, and, and, and was it was it is it was it Gerald, Gerald Cosloy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how I looked he it was, up. He was a magnificent friend to ECW. Gave us some great music that we usually used when running billboards and upcoming events and everything. He, he was a tremendous help. He really helped us out. Uh, he was one of the first, and, and you know, and, and then you think about it. By the end. One, a, a an investor in ECW in our very very last days was Jimmy Iovy, the most powerful oh, wow. man in music uh, of of the past 30, 40 years. You know, to this day, I mean, you know, so sold Beats to Apple for you know three point two billion dollars. At, at the time, Jimmy was the co chairman of Universal Music Group, which was Geffen, A and M, and Interscope. And Jimmy was a fan of ours because he started a, a rebel music label called Interscope uh, and, and disrupted the entire music industry. So he understood the struggles of ECW. Our only exposure besides when we did some co-promotion with WWE, then WWF on USA Network was after we were off TNN, we would get these little snippets on Jimmy and Doug's farm club, which was on USA network because Jimmy Iveen was trying to expose ECW again in our very last days, not just to his audience, but also to the USA network because we were negotiating with Stephen Chow, the president. And at the time, the chairman of USA, Barry Diller. That was, that was a wild time. I remember reading up on, that whole little 2001 era, I'm sure quite a stressful time for you as well. <laughs> but uh, well, it was seven and a half years of stress. I mean, it was also, you know, I, I, I can't I hard to say the best time of my life, because to me, the best time of my life is tomorrow. It's just the way I view things. But uh, I, I, I don't I don't regret a, a, a single day of it. You know, it was, it was a seven and a half year struggle to survive. Uh, and uh, there, there, there's an there's an, there's a certain adrenaline rush to that 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 you just can't duplicate. Yeah, I believe, and it's crazy now. I feel like ECW nostalgia has lasted twice or three times as long as the the actual promotion. Like the 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 brand still lives on today, and that's how strong it was. Just how what a passion the people had for it at the time, myself included. Well, again, well, then, then, then you identify with it. You know, it, we, we disrupted the game. I mean, we, we, Absolutely. we, I, I, we were, we were a cause, you know, we weren't a business. We were a cause. Uh, and, and, you know, at, at, at some time, the collection agencies and the lawyers and, and, and the need to pay bills will catch up to you. And, you know, we, we were, we were, we were juggling those chainsaws for seven and a half years. It's an interesting idea for people to say, well, that's an interesting business model. You made people, you know, you, you made people drink the Kool-Aid. You, you, you made people buy into the cause. No, we were the cause. I, if, if, if anybody drank the Kool-Aid, I probably drank the Kool-Aid more than anybody. We're certainly as much as anybody. We were a cause. And, and, and I, I, I can't recommend it as a business model for most other people. I think Bubba Ray Dudley says it best. We were Napster. We weren't meant to last. We were meant to completely change the game. We were meant to disrupt uh, the industry. And we were meant to go away and, 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 and live on as martyrs. And, uh, and, and, that's, what, and, and, and that's, that's the story of Napster. And whether fortunately or unfortunately, that's the story of ECW. Yeah, I think that that is a, a great comparison. Let's take it back a little. What are some of your favorite rock bands? And 
What was your first concert? You mean like besides when we were in kindergarten and, and we, we, you know, we, 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 we had to go to like these Christmas Hanukkah. Uh, right, right. Not dreidel dreidel. <laughs> I was a photographer at Madison Square Garden covering a Led Zeppelin concert. Oh, that's fantastic. 15 or, 15 or 16 years old. It was, it was right after the death of John Bonham. Hmm. And, and it was Led Zeppelin's first tour after the death of John Bonham. And, uh, um, and I was like, you know, I, I, I should be, again, you know, to just, just being a New York Jew boy. At everybody's bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah, the last song that was always played was Stairway to Heaven. It was your seven minutes in heaven. You know, like they dimmed the lights and this is what everybody got to make out and everything. <laughs> so <laughs> when, 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 you know, when Len Zepp was going to play the garden, Oh, okay. You know, I, I get, I get to see stairway, st- stairway to heaven live and I'm going to photograph it. Uh, and it, it was a game changer for me, you know, just w- watching Jimmy Page's reaction to the crowd and the interaction with the crowd as he hit the first notes of stairway to heaven um, and watching that through a camera lens. So my first concert was, was as a photographer and at Madison square garden, and I got to see Led Zepp. It, it's tough to top of that. I, I would agree. <laughs> uh, and I love just the, the whole story of how you kind of uh, hustled your way into being a photographer at Madison Square Garden. I think such an opportunity is only available to New Yorkers. I feel like if you grew up in New York, you're always like one or two steps away from success. You know somebody who knows somebody who's successful. So it seems much more achievable than if you lived in Ohio or somewhere in the Midwest. And so you just have the chutzpah, here's another one, uh, to just go and like try to hustle your way into being a, a photographer and ending up front row at a Led Zeppelin show and shooting WW, maybe WF shows at the time. Like how, how did you, what was your, what was your hustle to get in there? I didn't actually work for the garden. I hustled my way into WWF or WWF at the time. We'll just say WWE and make it easy yeah. for everybody to understand. One of us got thrown out in, at my second show because I approached Vince McMahon senior, the, the current chairman, Vincent Kennedy McMahon's father, Vincent James McMahon. I had at my first show, and, and if camera buffs will understand this, or if we're people who remember the, the pre digital age of photography, I used to shoot 400 ASA film. It's a very fast film, and you don't really need a flash with it, though I did use a flash. But in the garden lock, I was walking through the garden locker room about to turn right to go out to the ring. And I'm 15 years old at the time. And I see Vince, Vincent James McMahon with Andre the Giant in the hallway. And I turned off my flash and I kept my camera low. And I just started clicking away. I had 36 photos to take. And I knew I'd get a good one out of it. No flash. 400 ASA film. Didn't need flash. Natural light in the garden locker room. I'm covered. And... When I developed the pictures, I had quite a few good ones. And because I had shot from such a low angle, Andre just looked massive. So I printed up some black and white 8 by 10s And my father, who was a personal injury attorney in the Bronx, wrote up what was some sort of a photo release that the then company, Capital Wrestling Corporation, had all the rights to the pictures, could do anything they want with it. Put it on posters, put it in magazines, use it in press releases, throw it, you know, do whatever they want with it. Full, full rights, no fee, no credit needed. Or as much of a release as he understood how to write, because he wasn't an entertainment lawyer, he was a personal injury attorney, but he kind of understood how to write it up, you know? And I put it in a nice manila envelope and I approached Vincent James McMahon with it. And two cops from the garden picked me up from underneath my my uh, the, my elbows, and took me, and they were gonna, and they were throwing me out. And Howard Finkel, of all people, came over. Officers, officers, may I have a moment? Oh no, no, he's okay. Officers, is I had a press pass, and uh, the, he brought me back to Vincent James McMahon, and I was asked, "Did you take these pictures?" Yeah, I took them last last month in the garden. Oh, they're very good pictures. What's with the photo release? I said, "Well, they're of you. 
the Ravondre, it's your locker room, and I appreciate the opportunity to be backstage, and you can do whatever you want with them. You're going to school. He thought I was in college because I, 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 I looked older, as I do now, um, at 15, and I had a deep voice. Uh, and, and I said, and he said, are you, are you, are you going to, you're working your way through school? Yes, sir. I am. And he says, Oh, well, allow, allow me to help you. Just it must cost you money to come to the garden and help you with some trans money. And he put a $50 bill in my hand. He said, every month come to me with a couple pictures and, uh, please allow me to contribute to, to your transportation fund, uh, to come to the garden. Oh, thank you very much. Says, Take your education seriously, young man. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so every garden show, I'd go up to Vincent James McMahon. and give him a couple of pictures. And it'd be a 30 second. Oh, what do you think of the show? Oh, what, what are you looking forward to seeing tonight? Oh, what, what, do you, what, what do you think the audience wants to see? The most? 30 second conversation. Always very pleasant. A true gentleman. The Pope of Madison Square Garden. Um, but in the meantime, because I would be seen talking to someone that not many people from the outside would be even allowed to get near. Um, other people in the garden would see me. So a, a marketing executive or a garden executive or a state athletic commissioner who happened to have a lot of connections with the, the people that promoted the concerts or John Cher, the, you know, the music promoter or somebody else. There was always people backstage, you know, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> how do you know Vince? How do you know Vince McMahon senior? You know, and, and, and my answer was always some bullshit answer. You know, oh, I'm Paul Hammond. How do you not know me? <laughs> and, you know, and, well, you know, we, 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 we got this concert coming up or we'd like to come to a Knicks game or Rangers game or, you know, the Harlem Globetrotters, <laughs> whatever it was, you know, you should come down to this. Oh, you can could we have a couple of pictures? Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to give them to you. So I ended up being invited to all these shows at the garden all the time by either the promoters or the garden itself or somebody from the Knicks or the Rangers or the, the, the Harlem Globetrotters or whatever it was. And I just, I networked my way and I made connections. And, uh, and the first concert that I, 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 I took, I took the invitation seriously. I was invited to a couple of others I didn't go to. Uh, I wanted to see Led Zepp. So I went to a Led Zepp concert. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a great story. So let's, uh, let's talk about modern times really quick before we have to wrap up. What do you do for fun? Like when you're not at, at the arena, you know, getting the crowd to jeer you, the, the work is done. Cell phones powered off. Do you watch TV? Are you watching secession? Do you watch other wrestling? <laughs> what do you do for fun? I watch secession. I actually, I was late to the dance on succession. So I, I, I had to take the deep dive and go down the rabbit hole and catch up on it. Uh, I have been watching the new season. I'm a big fan of Peaky Blinders. Huge fan. Huge fan. Probably because the best character, maybe in the history of television, Alfie Solomons is a Jew um, <laughs> and played by Tom Hardy. And with the exception of when he does uh, a superhero, like I don't like I don't like the Venom movies, and 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 I uh, and I, I didn't like him as as Bane uh, in in the Batman movie. I I just I I, I like when Tom Hardy is is, is street level, um, and when he's street level, I th I think he's 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 the best. He and Gary Oldman, oh my god, and just love his work. So Tom Hardy. Uh, in Peaky Blinders, I, I, I study Peaky Blinders. I like Succession. I do. I'm a, I'm a news junkie. I watch I watch several different news shows. I've been doing this since the '90s. When I was in the '90s, I had an apartment in New York City, and, and I, I had a wall of television screens, and I had all different channels on them, so I could watch it. very ADD. Um, and, and 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 so I watched uh, I watched all different things at once so I, I i watch all the different news channels at once because i like to see the different coverage of, of, the, of the same story from all different perspectives so uh, but but what do i do for fun my job and i know I, I know that sounds like a real bs answer and i know that sounds like a cliche i love what i do absolutely love what i do 
I love the prep for it. I love the creative discussions leading into it. I love the six days in between the SmackDown that get our creative on track for what the performance is going to be live at 8 o'clock Eastern time every Friday night. Um, I love the day of the show and the lead up and, and the nuances and the idiosyncrasies um, of, of, of the character and the persona of the tribal chief Roman Reigns um, and the supporting cast like, like the Usos. I love the aftermath of the show in which we try to absorb what we've done, how we could have done it differently. Where does this lead us to next? Because, because at 10.01 Eastern time every Friday night, the first thought that goes into my mind and, and most likely in, into the mind of Roman Reigns is, okay, that, that's now official. What do we do? What do we do next Friday? And, and the process starts from that moment. And, and, and I enjoy it. I love it. I embrace it. It's, it's, it's nirvana. It's, it's euphoria to me. The, 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 the creativity and the refinement and the discussion and the open-mindedness with which Roman Reigns approaches this persona, this character, uh, and the discussions that we have, what to do, and just as importantly, what not to do, is spiritually orgasmic to me. So what I do for fun is my job. Well, it certainly comes across stuff on I TV. Do, <laughs> well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. You know, the other stuff I do, like watching Peaky Blinders or Succession or something, I'm always looking for inspiration for what we do. The, really, the only thing I do away from what we do, besides, you know, I have other projects. I, I always do other projects. I, again, I'm very ADD. Um, and I never like to only depend on one thing in my life. If, if, if this goes away, my children are okay, okay? College will be paid for. Don't worry about it. Um but unless I'm doing one of my other projects, the only time I take away from what I'm doing is just when I just, you know, when I'm with my kids and we're discussing their lives. Besides that, everything's about what I do. I was, I was going to say, like, is everything wrestling to you? I feel like to me, I mean, I'm just a fan. You're obviously in it. But like, I'm like, oh, that's a high spot. Or like, this guy's working. You know what I mean? Like, Or like, oh, that's a good, that's a good, like you're saying you watch all the new shows. Are you watching how like they're working the angle, so to speak, of like, this is the. No, I mean, my, my, my hopes and dreams and aspirations are, 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 are not solely confined to the sports entertainment industry. I own a creative agency in New York City. Well, I co-owned it. I, I co-founded it. I co-owned it with a brilliant partner named Mitchell Stewart. Brilliant. Brilliant. And uh, we've done big clients, 2K Sports, EA Sports, NASCAR, uh, the, the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino Las Vegas. Um, we've, had some very, we've had some very big clients. So, I mean, I do other things besides WWE. But when I watch things on television, I've always watched things with a director or producer's eye. Even when I was a kid, I could never just watch movies and get, and get engrossed in the movies. I was always like, wow, that, that camera shot fascinated me. Or it's interesting how the background noise bled into it. I, it's, it's just the way I'm wired. It, and it's funny that you asked me that. Just like is everything, everything always centered around, uh, around wrestling or sports entertainment. Um, once you're in this business, you see everything through the lens of this business. And the, the greatest example that I can give you, and it's kind of a macabre example, but it, it, it's, it's, a, it's just such a great insight to, to, the, to the mentality of, of how we look at things. Um, we were running a show in ECW and I had to attend the show. And there was someone, I don't remember who it was, unfortunately, and I don't mean any disrespect to that person, but. But there was a funeral on that day. I sent Bill Alfonso to the funeral to represent ECW. And Fonzie made it back just in time for the show. And I asked Fonzie, hey, how was the funeral? <laughs> he said, sold out, daddy. Sold people hanging off the rafters. And oh, what a baby face promo the priest gave. <laughs> Everything was just revolved around the, the funeral was sold out. And, and at that moment, it's like, oh, man, even in death, we can't get away from this. You know, this, this is it. We're not only lifers, we're, 
We're, we're you know, e- e- even the spirits' lives are, are are embedded around what we do in this business. The, it was sold out. The funeral was sold out. And what a baby face promo by the priest. And at that moment, I was like, okay, that's it. We're here. This, this is this is just how we view things. Before we wrap up, uh, I do want to mention that WrestleMania tickets are on sale through SeatGeek two nights uh, next year. going to be in Dallas. And Survivor Series is this Sunday, November 21st, 8 p.m. on Peacock in the U.S. and WWE Network, everywhere else. You're, you're going to be up there in the main event supporting the tribal chief, Roman Reigns. It's going to be the battle of the champions. Who is the better yes. champion? Uh, it, it is very much bragging rights. And, you know, talking about uh, if you could talk about the match, and I'm sure you assume Roman Reigns will win. Uh, uh, our Survivor Series is one of the classics. Are you excited uh, for the event? Well, I'm excited for the event. And, and I, I don't really assume Roman Reigns is going to win. I, I, I will. I will speak about this as as if the finish is predetermined. Um, Roman Reigns is going to smash Big E. And and that's not an assumption, a presumption, or even a prediction. It's a spoiler. Uh, Big E is great. And probably the the second most formidable talent in all of WWE. Hence the fact he's the WWE champion. Um, And he's going to get his ass kicked. He's going to get smashed. He's going to get smashed by Roman Reigns. And there's there's no there, there's no shame in being smashed by Roman Reigns. Look who's been smashed by Roman Reigns in the past twelve months, fourteen months. The, the Fiend was smashed by Roman Reigns, gone from WWE. Braun Strowman was smashed by Roman Reigns, gone from WWE. Kevin Owens was smashed by Roman Reigns. Edge and Daniel Bryan, Hall of Famer and guaranteed Hall of Famer, smashed by Roman Reigns at Mes- WrestleMania stacked on top of each other in the most declaratively dominant pinball in the history of WrestleMania main events by Roman Reigns. Cesaro, smashed by Roman Reigns. Edge, again, in a singles match, smashed by Roman Reigns. Daniel Bryan, smashed by Roman Reigns, banished from SmackDown in the process. And then a crown jewel, Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I almost left off SummerSlam. My apologies. John Cena smashed by Roman Reigns at SummerSlam. And then a crown jewel, Brock Lesnar of all people. My God, Brock Lesnar smashed by Roman Reigns in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Brock Lesnar. Big E, great talent. Amazing. Nobody on Raw can touch him. Anybody that goes up against Big E on Raw is going to get their ass handed to them. Big E is going to get his ass kicked. He's going to get smashed at Survivor Series. And there's no shame in it by Roman Reigns. Nobody better at talking me into an arena than Paul Heyman. Thank you so much, Paul. I look forward to Survivor Series this Sunday. It was an absolute honor to talk to you. I want to talk to you for a really long time. Thank you for taking the time. I agree with your assessment, sir. (laughs) 